All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for so much for coming out. Uh, my topic here is active defense. Uh, it's great to be here at uh, B-Sides Cleveland. Um, if you want, uh, there's my Twitter handle. It's at C3RKAH. Uh, feel free to follow that. Um, also, this slide deck is already on uh, SlideShare. I had a timer set to uh, publish it. So if you want to follow along on your own mobile device or check out the slides later, uh, they will be available. Thank you. And uh, with that quick introduction, my name is Matt Shear. Uh, I'm a system security engineer working in the financial services industry. Uh, I actually live and work around Cincinnati. I run a group down there called the Simpa Security SIG. Uh, if anybody happens to be around Cincinnati, third Thursday of the month, uh, look us up. Uh, we have a lot of great uh, meetings month to month. We're probably the most technical uh, InfoSec meetup on a monthly basis in Cincinnati. And I've spoken at a number of conferences. Last year, I attended four B-Sides conferences. This year, I'm spoken at all four, uh, counting this one. And uh, it's really special for me actually to be here B-Sides Cleveland because I grew up just 70 miles down south of on I-71 from Cleveland. So it's really awesome to be here. Uh, I've got some certifications. And uh, so, yeah, just a quick note. I have a day job, but the opinions... Uh, expressed today are solely my own. They don't express the views or opinions of my employer. Um, also, um, this is can be a little bit of a controversial topic on active defense because it's uh, sort of uh, a newer thing that isn't widely deployed yet. Um, so if you do this stuff, it's sort of uh, at your own risk. Uh, you will see as I cover the conventions ways that, you know, I sort of suggest um, how to perhaps be avoid or avoid being... Uh, reported for hosting malicious content. Um, so I want to talk about uh, what active defense is. Uh, so it can defer, or I'm sorry, can refer to a defensive strategy in the military or cybersecurity arena. The Department of Defense defines active defense as the employment of limited offensive action and counterattacks to deny a contested area or position to the enemy. In the cybersecurity arena, Active defense may mean asymmetric defenses, namely defenses that increase costs to cyber adversaries while reducing costs to cyber defenders. And certainly as we work through uh, some of these active defense techniques, you will see that in action. Uh, so I want to talk about why am I here to talk about active defense. And so the reality is whether you fall on the side of legalize or don't legalize hacking back, the fact is today that hacking back is illegal. Uh, and so active defense is sort of your next level beyond your basic honey pots, honey files, and honey nets. And our objectives today are to first shield and protect legitimate users at all times. And we want to make very certain that no innocent user would ever stumble across our active defense content. It's not going to show up in search engines. Uh, they're not going to link click something and get somewhere that you don't want them to. Uh, and then also we want to frustrate malicious threat actors that are attempting to steal and exfiltrate data through unauthorized access and preferably by getting them to actually hack themselves. And then finally, see objective number one, very important to protect innocent site visitors and people that might be searching for things through search engines. So our presentation focus is really going to be around active defense for a public-facing website. We're going to bait and set traps for script kitties and other cyber criminals. And this is a fun talk, so hopefully uh, everybody gets something out of it. <laughs> So some of the inspirations for this talk, um, I studied a lot of different martial arts long ago. Um, I don't practice really anymore, but uh, one of the things that stuck with me is a little bit of Aikido I did, which is sort of using an opponent's um, energy or force against them. Uh, that's sort of the Steven Seagal stuff, uh, if you're uh, sort of pondering that. Uh, also, my father, I don't know how many original thoughts he had, uh, but one of the great ones was... Uh, how he would handle junk mail. So he would get his mailbox flooded with junk mail. And what he would do is he would take out the parts that had his name on it, anything with the address, anything attributable back to him, and essentially use the prepaid envelope to send the junk mailers back their own advertisement uh, with the theory that they would have to pay postage then both ways to get their own advertisement back. And he thought if more people did this, we would get far less junk mail. Uh, so that was uh, definitely something I enjoyed. Uh, and uh, I've maybe done it myself a few times. Uh, 
So also nature, you may have noticed from the slide deck, uh, a lot of animal defenses, a lot of defenses in nature, um, a lot of other things, uh, just sort of intrigued by animals my, my whole life. And, uh, you know, seeing, you know, there's reasons people don't go messing around with porcupines, right, and skunks. Um, so also nostalgia, everything old is new again. And so some of the inspirations for these active defense techniques are very old. So old, in fact, there are things I read about that where people are putting in their old autoexec.bat files back in the early days of DOS. Um, and uh, they're so old, I don't remember who came up with them. I can't really source them. Uh, I try to do a good job where I, where I can remember, but uh, anyway, definitely security minded, but uh, absolutely a prankster at heart. Uh, I may or may not have uh, pulled many pranks on coworkers. Um, definitely the ones that uh, will forgive me. <laughs> and then finally, vigilante nature. I don't really mind seeing the bad guys sort of get what's coming to them. Um, and then, so I talked a little bit about this in the disclaimer. I've used a what I refer to as a hot water index. So the escalating thermometer temperatures indicate the greater potential for being reported for hosting malicious content. Uh, that's just the best guess guide. Uh, that's definitely uh, nothing official, but I did my best. Um, and then, so like I said, I want to talk about protecting legitimate users, something we want to do all the time. Uh, so we're going to cover different things here, creating a robots text file. Um, if you're familiar with those or not, we'll talk about it. Creating a sitemap file. Um, you know, just sort of a, a mention, don't link to active defense content. Use a hyperlink checker to uh, verify that. And then uh, also disabling directory indexing on legitimate content. Uh, as well as protecting yourself, potentially, by making use of authorized user-only messages. So the robot's text file uh, really um, is a file, and you can get the full reference on robotstxt.org, um, but really it essentially tells um, crawlers, um, archivers, things like that. It's sort of the keep out sign. These are the things that will tell legitimate services Stay out of these areas and don't index the stuff, don't reference it, don't uh, archive it. Um, and at the top here, you can sign it, see user agent. You could get very granular with this. Uh, the asterisk just simply says, regardless of what browser or service is hitting our site, um, these rules apply to everything. Um, and then the uh, disallows um, are really the areas where they're sort of our keep out sign that tells the rest of the internet, stay out of here. Um, and then the other thing that you maybe noticed, if I go back real quick, you see where the sitemap file is located. It actually defines that. Uh, so let's talk about the sitemap XML files. Uh, you can get the reference here for uh, sitemaps.org. Uh, Protocol.html has the uh, official uh, uh, language that you want to use. Um, you could obviously define a whole lot of URLs in here. This is just some of the schema. I'm basically telling it, hey, go ahead and, uh, you know, stay in the root folder. Uh, don't venture out of here. You could obviously define as much as you want. Uh, but this is just a very basic site I use for demo purposes and have a lot of fun reading the logs from. Um, so directory indexes. Um, it's just sort of a good security practice that you want to disable indexing from legitimate web content. So if somebody browses to a specific subfolder on your site, they don't get a list of all the files that are in there if there's not already a defined index uh, of some sort. Um, the lone exception to this I recommend is, uh, yeah, go ahead and leave indexing on for your active defense content. Uh, this is really just going to help ensure that it's the malicious threat actors out there that are actively scanning your stuff are going to find it. just makes it a little easier for them to uh, sort of fall into these traps. And then finally, authorized user-only messages. Um, this may or may not hold up, may or may not, you know, help you out. But if you can see in a log that somebody retrieved this file and then they try to claim, hey, your site kind of damaged me, uh, to me it's sort of like the street criminal that's trying to buy some street drugs and they actually get robbed. And so then they call the cops to say, hey, they didn't sell me their drugs. They just took my money and then, you know, chased me away with weapons or whatever. Um, but it could happen, right? So it's just something that may or may not help you. But I don't think it can hurt to say, hey, keep out of here. It doesn't say welcome. Just anybody can come in. 
Um, so the first act of defense I want to talk about, this one's very easy. It's simply called the round trip round kick. And the idea here is that you create a bunch of unused DNS subdomain host records that point back to the loopback address. And the fun part about that is the harder the threat actors think they're hitting you, the harder they're actually just hitting themselves. Um, and so it's just a fun thing. I've got a sample list here. You can obviously use more, or if you're actually legitimately using some of these, you know, sub them out for something else. Uh, but there's some good things in here. Um, dev, email, uh, FTP is definitely a good one. Mail.yourdomain.com, pointing back to the loopback, um, name servers, um, Outlook Web Access, um, also Auto Discover. Somebody's trying to figure out your Exchange environment. Webmail, obviously. Uh, WordPress. Uh, list goes on and on. So uh, just some ideas out there, but you can always create your own list. So this other one, it's more of a psychological uh, defense. Uh, the idea is stage an unreferenced folder. Unref by unreferenced, I mean something that is not defined in a robot's text file. Something that's in our sitemap file that you know doesn't point to a path with active defense content in it. The idea here is that we stage an unreferenced folder with a fake door badge ID template. Um, now, it should look convincing, but it shouldn't look exactly like what you use for work because there should be something distinguishable about it that's like, that's a phony ID. You don't want to actually give threat actors your real ID template. That would be dumb. Uh, <laughs> so, and also... What we want to do with this is play some gross out pictures of choice disguised as staff photo headshots. Um, so I have some friends with really warped senses of humor and they'll just, you know, they'll, it tends to be kind of juvenile at times. So, you know, they'll throw out pictures of goat see and meat spin and tub girl and just awful stuff, right? Uh, I'm going to spare you of that. Now, the first time I gave this talk was actually in front of my boss. I did not want to talk to human resources. Um, so most of the pictures are actually of people vomiting that are on the live site. Um, here you can see the uh, do door ID template. Uh, I'm just sparing you guys the vomit pictures. Uh, people, Some people have weak stomachs. Um, I can handle about anything, but uh, not everybody can. So uh, that's the idea behind that one. Um, another defense that uh, I sort of came up with, I simply refer to as reflector madness. Uh, and so the idea behind this one is we create an easy to crack password protected folder. Um, but what's waiting inside might not quite be what the, uh, the person expects. And so here is a sample file where I'm using HD access to basically password protect a uh, folder. So if somebody goes there on the web, they're actually getting prompted for a username and password. And I've left this intentionally super easy for somebody to crack into. Um, so uh, this would be a horrible username and password to work on a uh, home router, for example. Anybody want to take a guess at cracking this? Admin password, absolutely correct. And what they'll get is probably a connection refuse message like this. Um, but what they might get is something like this, which would be their own web server. Uh, and so the magic behind this is inside the source code, we have a CMOS iframe pointing back to the loopback address. So when somebody's trying to think, yeah, I totally cracked this folder, they're either going to be perplexed, why am I looking at my own web server on my local box? Or better yet, they might actually forget that they're running a web server. And even better if they have some forms and they start trying to crack literally their own site. They're firing a burp suite, trying to do cross-site scripting exploits, whatever. And they're literally at that point attacking their own box. Here's one I call going nowhere fast. Uh, and this is maybe a little similar. So WordPress is by far the most deployed content management system in the world. It powers countless websites. Um, so consequently, the WordPress login page is one of the most targeted uh, for brute force attacks by malicious threat actors. And so just a little bit of a soapbox thing here. Uh, I'm not completely of the belief that you can't have a reasonably secure WordPress deployment these days. Um, but there's a lot of caveats there, right? You have to keep the stuff absolutely up to date, um, and not not a lot of people are good at that. Um, you also have to make sure you don't have excessive themes out there. Uh, there's really, other than having your parent theme and your child theme, uh, maybe you can make an argument for keeping the uh, deployed theme on there and deactivated in case you had to get back in and troubleshoot. Um, I've had to do that before. Potentially even the current default theme 
uh, just because. But really, I can't think of a single reason to have any more than three or four themes. Um, you should deactivate anything you're not actively using and probably delete anything that you're never going to use. Um, but really, the biggest Achilles heel is the plugins. So the WordPress plugins are by far and away the most... Um, exploited road to compromise in WordPress in my experience. And part of the reason is because a lot of them are free, community developed. And uh, the other reason is a lot of WordPress developers are really just sort of plug-in jockeys. And they don't really know how to code. Um, I actually heard of one from a web developer friend of mine. She was talking to another WordPress developer. Didn't even know what PHP was. And so... WordPress is built on PHP. If you don't know what PHP is, I don't think you can legitimately call yourself a developer, maybe a designer. But anyway, the point is, WordPress lives everywhere, and malicious threat actors absolutely know it, so they're coming after it. Now this is a live WordPress login page, wp-login.php. Anybody want to guess the username and password for this? Admin password? Well, you could try that. Um, it's not actually going to work, though. And the reason it's not going to work is because it's a completely fabricated WordPress login page. There's absolutely no u real username or password. So the goal is to have brute force attackers spin their wheels, um, thus wasting their time, energy, and resources. Uh, this is further sold by planning the appropriate folder structure and default files that give away a site as WordPress, such as the readme.html file and the license.txt files. Yeah, I threw them out there. Um, and again, you're unlikely to get reported for malicious content. Uh, I actually have great fun looking in the logs. The Russian Federation is continuously trying to uh, crack this website. Of course, they'll never quite get it because there is no username and password that'll work. So this act of defense might potentially get you reported for malicious content, um, but I call it pie to the face. Uh, and there's a lot to unpack here. So uh, we're going from disinformation to wasting attackers' time to potentially getting them banned from larger service providers to burning their CPU cycles and draining their batteries. And so we start by using enterprising cyber criminals' own cryptojacking techniques against them. So the idea here is that I have a webmaster folder, and it contains a bookmarks.html file. To an enterprising malicious threat actor that's trying to attack a website, that's a juicy target. If I know all the sites that the webmaster is using, I can maybe understand the code a lot more about the organization. Um, it really sort of is great intel to have. Um, but what we're going to do is uh, stage non-existent login account links for popular sites and services that an attacker uh, might waste time trying to brute force. Uh, hopefully... Um, so it's one thing if I block a malicious threat actor trying to hack my site, it's one domain on literally countless. They'll just simply move on to the next target. Um, so some of these providers, some of the bigger providers, if they block them, they might have bigger issues. Um, so, for example, if Microsoft, Google, Facebook, somebody like that, uh, I don't know if they have thresholds, but if you hit them uh, and they do ban you, you might have bigger problems than if it's just me and my one site out there. Um, and then, oh, by the way, behind the scenes, what we're doing is we're uh, computing pi hundreds of thousands of times. Uh, we wash, rinse, and repeat. I'm going to talk about those a little bit. Um, so some of the targets I set up are a Facebook um, login page, Google, LinkedIn, Microsoft, Twitter, Yahoo. Um, all of them using webmaster at the domain I'm, I'm got.com. Now, the important thing to note here is none of these accounts ever actually exist. Um, I've never created them. So... The, and I tried to make it as easy as possible, so the links all open up in new tabs for them. Uh, as many as I can, pre-fill the information. It didn't work the way I wanted for everything. Google, for example, will not pre-fill in the username. At least I couldn't figure out how. I only spent maybe five to ten minutes trying to reverse engineer that. Um, but it will let you uh, try to register it. Um, LinkedIn has a weird effect where it'll only do that if you're already logged in. And it's really weird because it shows you logged in at the upper right, and then in the middle it sort of prompts you to log in again. 
uh, Twitter, Yahoo work exactly like I expect. A uh, quick note about Microsoft Live ID. Email is actually not the right field. It should be um, username. The reason I put email in there is I discovered something interesting. So Microsoft has been around a long time. They go back to the 1970s. Unfortunately, Live IDs sort of use security principles for authentication that go back to the 1970s. And what happens, it'll actually tell you, not that the username or password is invalid, it'll tell you that the username is invalid. So if I'm an enterprising cyber criminal, I'm probably just going to use that to enumerate valid IDs because I can tell from the return I get from the site and doing a post uh, whether or not a username is valid. If Once I have valid usernames, then it becomes trivial to just start uh, trying to brute force passwords. Um, so that was uh, I, I didn't really want that to come up and say, hey, this isn't a working username. Um, What's interesting is it recognizes the field because it'll let you one click try to, you know, basically register for that. Um, and so the idea here is to keep the uh, malicious threat actors looking at this stuff and trying to crack these accounts as long as possible. Because what's underneath the scenes is some uh, source code up near the top. Um, you'll notice I put in a meta refresh every 3.14 seconds. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, and then basically at the bottom, I'm calling two script files. So I want the page to load, stay up as long as possible, um, and keep the uh, threat actors enticed as long as possible. These are identical JavaScript files. What they do is they compute pi over 314,000 times each. Now I can increment this number and um, it will, the duration will last longer, but I noticed an interesting effect where it'll actually pop up in browsers and say, hey, this tab or window is taking an extremely long time to load. Do you want to close it? And the answer is absolutely not. I want them to leave it open as long as possible because I don't want the threat actors to know that I'm doing something uh, sort of you know, they're not expecting behind the scenes. And also, I don't want them to close the window. This is not persistent, right? So as soon as I close the tab or window that's got this code open, it goes away. Um, and so what that'll do is on a lower powered system or a dual core VM, it'll spike the CPU all the way up to 100%. Uh, on a moderately powered system, uh, maybe up to 50%. But if they're running like Burp Suite or Zap or a whole lot of tools, particularly Java-based tools that just grind away CPU cycles like they're nothing. Um, it could also, you know, that combined with this can definitely get you back up to a hundred percent. And then also sort of a note. So if they're on battery power using a laptop, for example, uh, the high CPU load, instead of running like maybe an average of three to seven percent, uh, it's going to drain their battery a whole lot faster, basically forcing them to a, a power receptacle. So this one I simply call the wrong answer. Uh, and so just by a show of hands, who here has had a system where the hard drive got 100% full, zero disk space, it crashed, you had to recover it. I see a few hands here. I've done it. Oh, it's better now than it used to be, but it used to be awful. Like I remember having to literally, systems you couldn't get to reboot again, having to take the drive off, cable it off on a working system, and then clean up enough disk space from the other live system just to free up enough disk space to be able to then boot again and do further cleanup. Um, so the idea behind this is that we create a, a folder um, and we give it an intensity file name, so we make it look like a human resources folder. And something like employee salary history, uh, xls.zip, it's really just a renamed version of the infamous 42.zip. For those of you not familiar with 42.zip, it's simply a 42 kilobyte compressed zip file. Fully uncompressed will extract to, you know, upwards of 4.2 petabytes of data. Most data thieving cyber criminals, they're not going to have a hard drive that large. And so, they're going to recover their disk. That They're going to have a bad day. And so this other one, uh, sort of the final one, uh, I call it Bobby Dropkick. And it's directly inspired by this um, XKCD cartoon called Exploits of a Mom. Uh, and the cartoon is, hi, this is your son's school. We're having some computer trouble. And mom says, oh, dear, did he break something? And school says, well, in a way, did you really name your son Robert Drop Table Students? Oh, yes. Little Bobby Tables, we call him. Well, we've lost this year's student records. I hope you're happy. 
Mom says, and I hope you've learned to sanitize your database inputs. And so the idea behind this one is that we uh, stage a uh, fake employee database dump file instead of an, inside of an unreferenced folder. Um, so we like call org departments human resources. Uh, we'll give it an enticing file name such as uh, the, um, you know, we'll just give it an old date so it looks like a backup file. Um, human resource information systems employee MySQL DB backup. Um, you can zip it up uh, just to keep people from uh, hammering too much of your bandwidth, or you could just go native with it. So the interesting thing is I actually went looking for a sample database that wouldn't have real person information in it, but be convincing. And uh, the great thing is MySQL uh, on their Git repository, somebody actually had a project where they had a sample database of fictitious information. Now they had um, basically split it out into a bunch of mini dump files. I actually imported the whole thing and uh, export it out as one large file. Um, but I didn't just export it out as one large file. Um, there were a few other little tidbits in here uh, that I inserted near the bottom. Not at the very bottom of the window. You would have to scroll up at least one page to see it. Um, now, unfortunately, I couldn't find a command that would drop all of the databases. Uh, believe me, I looked. Uh, if somebody knows of one, though, let me know. I couldn't find one. So the next best thing I could do was drop the internal database tables that MySQL needs to run. And this has an interesting effect that it hoses the database server. And interesting thing is once you lose some of the schema information, um, you're pretty much out of luck if you don't have good backups. Now, the threat actors and a lot of security people love to beat their chest. Oh, well, they should have had backups, and it's sort of their fault they got owned because they didn't have good backups in place uh, to be able to recover from. Well, let's find out how much you know, or how well they eat their own dog food. Um, so an interesting note is I actually moved information schema to the bottom. Uh, reason being is that uh, it actually stops at a certain point. So what that does is it builds out the entire database and then it drops the internal databases. Uh, the information schema has some read-only content in it uh, and it will basically crash the import process. So I wanted to clear off as much as possible. Uh, it will get so far, I believe, into this uh, before it actually hits that stage. Um, so anyway, the idea here is if that if you thought that recovering from a filled up hard drive is a hassle, and it is, trying to recover a database server like this without the internal databases and the MySQL server is completely down, uh, unless you have good backups, uh, you're in for a bad day. So I'm certainly not the only one doing active defense stuff. Um, and I think probably the best project out there going is uh, Black Hills Information Security, who, interestingly, is one of the sponsors here. Uh, but they have the ADHD, which is the Active Defense Harbinger Distribution, uh, which is basically a Linux distro that's chock full of a lot of other active defense techniques and strategies. Uh, they are sort of very big on um, using uh, canary files, canary tokens, to basically phone back home um, this project is well documented. There's a lot of great instructional information. Uh, be, it's really very simple to deploy uh, on your own, but uh, I believe SANS offers a SEC 550 class uh, where they actually, it's based on this distribution. Um, I actually saw on Twitter they just released an update fairly recently for uh, ADHD. I haven't had a chance to look through the uh, change logs, um, but I'm sure there's some good stuff in there. Uh, and there's the uh, URL for the uh, um, SANS course, if anybody wants to check that out. Um, so some quick commentary on this stuff. So. Yeah, I've had a few criticisms on it. Um, one of my good friends is like, oh, man, I love the reflector madness, but you really should make the login hard. It, I don't want it to be an easy crack. Well, actually, I improved the uh, the payload on that. This was before that. I kind of had a taunting message. Um, I wanted to try to show him that there was merit to it, so that's why I went with Reflector Madness uh, and sort of improve what was in there. Um, but the thing is, you can really make that password as simple to defeat or as hard to defeat as you want. Um, I feel like there's enough other time wasters in this active defense site that uh, don't really need too much there. Um, 
anybody conducting a legitimate penetration test might run into this stuff. Um, hopefully it's not just a pure black box engagement. Uh, the idea here is that if you have good documentation prepared in advance of white box or gray box engagements, uh, you can basically tell the penetration tester head, beware of the stuff in here. That's just a bunch of active defense traps that we're uh, trying to uh, make the bad guys um, sort of reconsider their life decisions a little bit. Um, and then also uh, having the robots text file um, and being able to explain what's in those folders will also help them out to understand what's there. Um, some other express concerns um, is that, hey, I'm not going to implement this. It might really tick off some skilled attackers and vindictive people. Um, so the problem, as I see it, is that malicious threat actors are really undeterred today. They don't fear retaliation because hacking back's illegal. They don't fear retribution because, by and large, we don't do anything about it. We just try to improve our normal defenses and make it a little harder for them. Um, and then finally, the fact that Brian Krebs, uh, the um, journalist who runs Krebs on security.com, also the author of Spam Nation, who's uncovered um, a lot of sort of Eastern European and Russian uh, sort of spam operations and uh, sort of uh, exposed the those people. Um, there have been sort of, like he's had swatting attempts against him. Uh, he's gotten a lot of threats. Uh, I've actually seen his his talk where he sort of has gone over. But if you follow his blog, you've sort of understood the things that the uh, threat actors have done to sort of try to get back at him. Um, the fact that he's alive today, I think he is much higher on the target list than I would be. So I don't worry too much about uh, anybody coming after me, anything like that. Um, you know, try to try to do things defense, you know, good enough where you know, I can see in the logs and, and kind of understand what's going on. Um, and then finally, if you're really not convinced that active defense is a good way to go, uh, if you just don't want to do it, look, I'm just here to give people an informational infosec talk. I'm not here to tell you how to live your life. You don't have to do this stuff. Um, so I've got some time here. Uh, let me go ahead and do a couple quick live demos and uh, bear with me here. I'm going to have to put the mic down so I can uh, get some keyboard commands in here and... Uh, let me see if I can get this going here. Apologize for the strobe show there. Uh, it's a weird uh, thing that sometimes happens on HDMI. Uh, hope nobody has epilepsy in here. <laughs> so I've got OWASP Zap fired up, which is the uh, Z Attack proxy. Um, Zap is basically a free program for AppSec testing. Um, it comes native to Kali Linux, but it's also a free download. Uh, it does require Java, um, but then again, so does Burp Suite. Um, so one of the questions I sometimes get is, well, how do you know that the malicious threat actors are actually going to find this content? Like, like, yeah, you say these things will work, but you know, how do you know? And, and so one of the reasons is I know the wget command line options to ignore a robot's text file uh, and so forth. But also, I fully know and understand that there are tools like Zap out here that, uh, well, let me just show you. Not only will it sort of ignore the rules that normal users and uh, legitimate services would follow by our sitemaps um, XML file and our robots text file, um, you'll see it actually will use those to sort of feed information to an attacker. By the way, this is very simple. I'm literally just opening up the program and I'm going to type in the uh, website here. Bear with me one sec. So quite literally just pushing in the uh, URL and hitting the attack button. 
and it's going to get so far, it's going to kind of stall here at 99%. So what I could do is I could interact with this session using this tool and, and so forth. Um, I can also look at, uh, you know, the output to understand what my security vulnerabilities are. Um, but I just want to show um, everyone sort of how easy this is to find accidental exposure. I'm going to export it here. Um, switch over to... So here I've basically exported the file. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and open it up in a spreadsheet application because it's easy to look at that way. And so here we are in Calc. And so you might be wondering, um, Again, on finding this stuff. And I do want to scroll up here real quick. And I know this is going to be a bit of an eye chart. So you see these top here, these things that it's seeding on. So the root folder, or the root directory, rather, of the website is one of the seeds that this is using. Uh, it's actually, again, using the robot's text file, not to find out what content to ignore, but actually seed the rest of this so it knows where the... Um, content actually is, and the same with the sitemap. So it's actually leveraging these files that normally are used to keep innocent users from stumbling across this stuff to actually um, where threat actors will find it. And so just simply looking at the uh, export here, I'm going to go through, and so here you start seeing um, some of the areas uh, where the active defense content is. Um, scroll down here, actually show some of the uh, specific items. So here's our, uh, our headshots. There aren't really uh, employees. It's just meant to look like they would be employees um, in here. Let me go back up. Here's the uh, MySQL database file that will dump the MySQL internal database files. Yeah, it found that. Um, it really does find everything as I look through it here. Um, here's our door badge ID template uh, that's meant to be a uh, convincing decoy. And let's see here, looking for some of the other juicy stuff. Here's our fake WordPress login page. Yeah, I found that too. Um, so really, it, it finds pretty much everything in here. Uh, it's a little hard for me to look at the, the screen from this vantage point. But, uh, yeah, here you see actually the uh, usernames and passwords, these fake um, accounts we created for all these different sites and services. Here's the employee salary history that's the uh, 42 zip file. Uh, so, yeah, it pretty much finds everything. And so from here, like the barrier to entry for an attacker is very low. They can just simply copy and paste the uh, address you know, put it in wget, put it in curl, put it in their browser even uh, to pull this content down. Uh, so that's one thing that's uh, very simple to do um, for them. Let me go ahead and also show off uh, pie to the face here a little bit. Um, let me bring this up. So got my browser window open and uh, give me a moment here as I uh, go ahead and uh, put in the website address. So here's the uh, bookmarch HTML file, um, and it'll load here in a moment. Um, actually, before I do that, let me uh, go ahead and close that out, and I will open it back up here in a second. So let me fire up HTOP.
So some of this uh, stuff is, uh, you know, sort of an eye chart. But what you see are these first four bars at the top here. That's actually the CPU. Um, and you can see we're running uh, a little high. So we're basically double digits, um, mostly about in the uh, mid to uh, upper teens uh, for CPU utilization. Uh, let me come back here. And now let me actually open up the... Uh, um, Pie to the face. So now what you see is the uh, CPU is definitely spiking up there. At this point, we're burning a lot of juice. Um, we're running, uh, you know, in the 60 percent. Um, with uh, so this is really sort of going to grind it down. You've actually seen the performance hit live on the system while I've actually been trying to demo this. Uh, so that's actually the CPU spike. Uh, you read about uh, crypto jacking all the time where the threat actors are popping popular websites and putting crypto mining currency on there. Uh, it's not an attack I wanted to monetize, but uh, one I, uh, I put out there. Um, and then let me go ahead and just uh, sort of go back and kill it. And uh, you've already seen kind of the before and you know, the after will confirm that once the uh, once that goes away, you can see that, uh, you know, our CPU goes much back, well, back to something much more resembling normal on this. So that's active defense. Um, let me go ahead and also uh, see if I can uh, pull up the uh, WordPress page. So here's the WordPress login page. It really doesn't matter sort of what input I, I put in here. Um, it basically is just going to uh, blank out the page and return it back to, you know, where it was. And by the way, this is a great thing that you can log to sort of put together your own password list that the threat actors out there are actually using. Uh, so you can definitely do some double duty with this if you're uh, capturing that information in the logs. A uh, great way to collect that information. Um, and so, yeah, with that, um, let me go back to the presentation here and we'll kind of wrap it up. So with that, are there any questions from the audience about any of this? Yes. Have you done much, uh, much logging on the side that keeps speaking of what the right actors are doing with these active defense tools? In particular, I'm kind of curious if you've seen anybody download or pull a zip file for us. You know, I haven't looked for that, honestly. I've seen people download the zip file, interestingly. Um, I haven't actually looked. Um, that's something I will definitely sort of file away to look at, though. That would be interesting to know if somebody is actually dumb enough to download this thing a second time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Uh, by the way, it's sort of funny. I had a pen traction tester friend of mine look at the WordPress login page. And he's like, hey, you know, that might be vulnerable to cross-site scripting. I'm like, great, because I have a really warped sense of humor. And nobody legitimate would ever visit that page, right? It's only people looking to brute force and hack a WordPress site that would ever actually visit it. And so I sort of had this take this glee in thinking that here's malicious threat group B trying to cross-site script this thing that now malicious threat group B is trying to get to. Now, at this point, they're literally hacking each other. And so you put sort of threat actor groups actually trying to hack each other, uh, which is fantastic thought. So I definitely haven't put in any code to uh, remediate that uh, potential uh, vulnerability because it's not a legitimate page. Now, ordinarily, I would have already scanned for it, already tried to fix it on my own. Uh, so just sort of a quick point on that. So, all right. 
Everybody, if there aren't any more questions, I will be around. Feel free to hit me up after this. Um, also, speaking 2 o'clock on fishing forensics, is it just suspicious or is it malicious downstairs? Uh, so if you want to see another presentation, uh, I've got another one to go today. Thank you, everybody, for coming out.